Today, I wanted to discuss a very unusual impact event that happened on the planet 2.5 million years ago that might have been responsible for transforming the planet by initiating what's known as the Ice Age. But before we discuss the details, I actually have to start with how we know all of this and how all of this was discovered. And it actually starts with this vessel you see right here, USNS Iltanen, a former US Navy ship that became reclassified as a scientific vessel and in 1964 became an Antarctic research vessel and started to collect a lot of sample cores from the ocean floor while also photographing the seabed. Back then, and actually for decades afterwards, this particular mission became unusually popular because of this picture. The photo of what became known as the Eltanian Antenna, a very bizarre structure at a depth of 3900 meters or 13,000 feet that because of its unusual shape was almost instantly linked to a lot of UFO related theories. And strangely enough, it wasn't actually until 2003 that actual marine biologists saw this picture and were able to definitively identify what this was. And well, you see it right here. A type of a carnivorous sponge known as Chondrocladia concrescens with a much more common name, ping pong tree sponge. Something that was actually discovered all over the place, but something that's still very mysterious because of the depths where we usually find these deep sea organisms. But because this mission was also physically collecting samples from the seafloor as well, at some point, some of these sedimental samples became analyzed as well. And it turns out that an intriguing study came out announcing that they discovered an unusual iridium anomaly in one of the seacore samples known as E13-3. This one was discovered at a depth of 5000 meters and seemed to contain way too much iridium for all of this to be natural or for all of this to come from planet Earth. And the analysis of isotopes eventually matched this to a lot of different chondritic meteorites. But the question is, what exactly was it doing so deep and how exactly did any of this get there? And well, within a few years, by 1988, the researchers proposed an intriguing hypothesis. In this study by Frank Kite and his team, they actually discovered even more evidence and more isotopes in a really large area across 600 kilometers of the Southeast Pacific seafloor, suggesting that this was a sign of a huge impact, with the size of the asteroid being at least 500 meters or 0.3 miles. With the follow-up expedition in 1995 collecting more samples and establishing the date to be approximately 2.1 million years ago. So approximately 400,000 years since the beginning of Quaternary or essentially since the beginning of Ice Ages. But around the same time, scientists studying various deposits in Antarctica and also scientists studying deposits in places like Chile in South America started to actually discover completely different signs from what seemed to be an ancient mega tsunami. A tsunami that seems to have traveled from the point you see right here and seems to have affected a lot of different regions around the same time. Here it seemed to be coming from waves up to a hundred meter high, all coming from the same location somewhere southwest of South America. And more importantly, it suggested that the initial wave was probably several hundred meters in height, possibly even up to one kilometer. Here we had signs from places like Antarctica, Chile, Australia and New Zealand, with the evidence pointing at the same phenomenon, a really large tsunami wave generated by something very powerful. But the dates here did not really add up. This particular tsunami seems to have happened a little bit earlier. And well, this led to another expedition, the one in 2001 that once again reanalyzed everything, discovering that all of this iridium was actually deposited 2.5 million years ago, plus minus 70,000 years. And this matched the tsunami, with further computer simulations discovering that it was most likely caused by the asteroid at least one kilometer in size, but possibly up to four kilometers in size striking the planet at 40 kilometers per second, but most importantly, hitting very deep ocean, right here. And that's what makes this particular impact so unique. This is the only known asteroid impact in the deep ocean. It left no crater, but it left signs of impact all over the place. With the first signs discovered by Eltanen, or maybe Eltanen, I guess I keep mispronouncing it, but basically because of this, this is now known as the Eltanen impact. The most powerful recent impact, equivalent to approximately 100 billion to possibly even 10 trillion tons of TNT, which is by the way hundreds of times more than all of the nuclear bombs combined on the planet, exploding all at once, 
and depositing the fragments over a region 660 by 200 kilometers in size. And that's of course those samples collected earlier, where we definitely see signs of iridium, but we also see signs of mixing of melted ejecta with seawater salts, which can only be explained by a powerful explosion caused by a powerful impact, mostly because seafloor here is at least 3 kilometers deep. But based on the evidence, and obviously based on the simulations, we don't think this impactor ever reached the seafloor. It basically evaporated and exploded by hitting the water at extremely fast velocities. Which of course means that it also ejected an enormous amount of material into the atmosphere. Huge amounts of water vapor, but also sea salts, sulfur, and a lot of dust that came from the asteroid itself. With all of this stuff remaining in the atmosphere for at least two years, possibly much longer. And so this of course leads us to this main proposition. Today, a lot of scientists believe that this impactor was potentially the last straw that essentially initiated the Ice Age, more officially known as the Quaternary Glaciation or Pleistocene Glaciation. In essence, a series of different glaciation and interglaciation periods that shifts between the period of extended ice sheets, during which the sea levels usually drop, and enormous ice sheets form in the North Hemisphere, with Antarctica expanding in the Southern Hemisphere, and the interglacial period, when the overall climate is much warmer, the sea levels are much higher, with the whole planet transforming in a lot of different ways as well. For example, during the last such period, which was approximately 125,000 years ago, apparently various forests were able to reach all the way to north of Norway, where today we basically have almost nothing. And back then, the sea levels were at least 6 to 9 meters higher, and the average temperature was about 2 degrees Celsius higher as well. And so this unusual oscillation between glacial and interglacial periods has now been happening for 2.5 million years. But 2.6 million years ago, Earth was not actually doing this, and looked a lot different as well. Or at least different in certain locations. Here it was at least 3 degrees warmer, and so the sea levels were 30 meters higher. And back then, Antarctica was much warmer as well, with the ice sheets barely present and usually only appearing in the winter. And though the Earth was slowly cooling down, it did not go through these unusual glaciation periods. And so something must have happened 2.5 million years ago to transform everything and to trigger these unusual events. Now the actual answer is potentially super complex and very likely involves plate tectonics, changes in ocean currents, and possibly Milankovitch cycles, but there must have been at least one main trigger. And just like with the extinction of dinosaurs, that trigger was potentially an asteroid. And today we have a lot of evidence that it was indeed this Piltanian asteroid that only left very minor signs in the depths of the Pacific Ocean and on the shores of Antarctica, South America, Australia and New Zealand. And so following this impact, which very likely dramatically shifted the climate, the ice sheets suddenly started to appear because the albedo or reflectivity of the planet was suddenly enhanced dramatically due to all of the sulfur released by the impact. While at the same time all of the dust in the atmosphere, which also came from the asteroid, very likely made the days much darker and thus lowered the temperature even more. And so here within just two years, the temperatures very likely dropped dramatically, most likely initiating the first glaciation period. And it very likely had other effects as well. Possibly depletion of ozone layer, possibly acidification of the oceans, which by the way we know happened during the dinosaur extinction event, and you can learn about this in one of the previous videos in the description. And because of all of these effects, it might have had some kind of a localized extinction that we just don't really know much about. But it was this impact that most likely led to the first glaciation and the first extended ice sheets in the northern hemisphere. But I guess what's really unusual and somewhat difficult to explain is why is it that the ice ages are still going on? Technically, this impact should have stopped the ice age once the planet warmed up, just like it did previously with the Chicxulub event 66 million years ago. But for some reason, the glaciation that happened 2.6 million years ago essentially turned into a repetitive cycle that's still going on today and will most likely repeat again in the next 40,000 years. And so here, even though we do have evidence for what potentially started the Ice Age, we have no idea why it's not stopping. Unless, of course, this hypothesis is maybe not complete or completely incorrect. Maybe this impact actually played a very small role or possibly no role at all 
And maybe the fact that it happened around the same time when the Ice Ages started was just basically some kind of a coincidence. Nevertheless, this is still a super intriguing event that we unfortunately know so little about. Mostly because it's kind of difficult to study this, since most of the evidence is on the bottom of the ocean. And it's an intriguing event because it produced one of the biggest tsunamis ever, with actual signs in a lot of different locations. But at least for now, that's I guess all I wanted to discuss. Once there are new studies or new discoveries, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, check out some of the studies and some of the other links in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.